Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 489. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a very proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on this network, please go and visit evergreenpodcast.com. So this week's interview I'm excited to announce is with Heather Monahan. Heather's a top-ranked keynote speaker, podcaster, two-time best-selling author and board member of HealthLinked Corporation. Her latest book, Overcome Your Villains, Mastering Your Beliefs, Actions and Knowledge to Conquer Any Adversity has been a runaway success. We discuss her remarkable career and some of the key points and stories in her book, including how to turn the time machine on its head, managing the line between fear and excitement, why and how to show up as the real you, from who to ask advice, as well as Heather's brilliant way of narrating the audiobook with her behind-the-scenes vignettes. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com, and if you can spare a moment, please go and drop in a rating and review, and of course, don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Heather Monahan, such a pleasure to have you on my show to talk about your book, what you've been up to, and and really dig in on and how you got to where you are. So, in your own words, Heather, how would you like to present yourself? I'm top fifty keynote speaker for the year 2022. I'm a best-selling author of two different books. Most recently, Overcome Your Villains with Harper Collins Leadership, a former C-suite executive in corporate America. Brilliant. So. You, your book is brilliant. I, I really enjoyed, I, I, I didn't read it. I listened to it. And the fact that you spoke it really brought it alive for me. So um, I was wondering to what extent you enjoyed the experience of reading your book. And did you, I, I, I if I phrase it another way, I felt that it was so natural for you to speak it. Some people write books that they sort of speak to write. Uh, I, I write, and then I, I, when I have to do my audio version, I'm like, oh, sometimes that's a little bit clunky. Yours felt like it was just straight, straight from your mouth. And tell me uh, how it was for you. So it was my second book that I wrote. My first book I wrote in 2018, and I narrated that one. And then I had a podcast since 2019. And I've been a public speaker for 20 years. So that's sort of, you know, I believe everyone has a superpower. That's definitely mine speaking. So really narrating a book is just speaking life into a book. So that's, it's, it's what I'm good at. So I'm, I'm glad that you like that. I've gotten great feedback on it. Well, what I'm referring to, though, is the difference between how you write and how you speak. And certainly what comes through is you know how to speak. But oftentimes the writing when you reread as in out loud the the written word, it, it doesn't come quite as naturally. So in your writing process, do you write it or do you speak to write? I just, I don't overthink anything. I just do. So when I sit down to write, I just start writing. I don't have a strategy to it. You know, I just write whatever comes to my mind and then my editors edit it and, and then it's a book. And then before you know it, it's a narrated book. And um, you know, it just kind of, I believe in like, just do it, get it done, get the content out there. All right. So I, I need to know a little bit more about behind the scenes because in the books that I have done for audio audible, it's extremely strict as to what they're allowing you to do and how you have to stick to formats and so on and so forth. Behind the scenes, you add to every published chapter because you published it before pan well you wrote it before pandemic and then you published and spoke the afters so tell me about the behind the scenes because those are absolutely riveting and really make the book a very different experience so i had listened to david goggins um book i think it's called you can't break me and he does not narrate it he has a professional narrator narrate the book and at the end of every chapter, he would just give his opinion of a behind the scenes from the lens of his eye. And I remember I had listened to that book probably in 2018. It was after I had narrated my first book. And I loved the context that that allowed for and the insight that it gave. So I, I remember saying to myself after I heard that, 
the next time I narrate one of my books, I'm going to use the same methodology. My second book I did with HarperCollins Leadership. So I had to get approval from the head of audio uh, in order to do it because as a writer, you think that you have, you know, all the decision-making ability, but when you publish with a traditional publishing house, you don't. And so I made a pitch for the head of um, the audio division that I wanted to do this kind of behind the scenes riff after each chapter to get people up to speed with what had happened since I'd written the book. And he was all for it. And, um, and I ended up using, I was in the radio business for 25 years. I used one of my producers who I'd known for two decades, who's a wonderful person I'd worked very closely with. And so I just told him my idea. I said, let's, I have no idea how it'll work, but once I'm done reading, like give me a minute just to drink a, a water and then just hit record and let's see what I say. And that's basically how we did it. Wow. So it was really quite unscripted. I mean, obviously you, you thought about what you wanted to say, but you just went, you just ripped. I mean, this is what no, happened. I didn't, is- I didn't think about it. I, 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 that's like, that's definitely me. I don't think about things like that. I don't sit around saying, oh, this is what I want to accomplish with, you know, this behind the scenes. I just wanted to go from a feeling. So I hadn't read the book in so long. You know, I'd written the book a year prior. So once I finished a chapter, he would give me one minute just to take a a drink of water. And then I'd say, hit hit it. And I would just explain like how I felt based off reading that chapter, having not had read it in a year. It strikes me, Heather, that this is for me the biggest learning. Uh, You know, outside of the fact that you sort of, you're very straightforward and you like to do action. The idea of being who you are is is not a scriptable thing. I would hope not. <laughs> and yet so many people do that and and they they think that they think overthink, they they practice and I mean you do need to practice when you're a speaker. So there are things you do need you can't just sort of wing it all the time there are skills and 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 talents that need to be brought together but what i what i one of the things i really took away from this was bring your whole self and it felt for me that in the behind the scenes you were not just saying it you were doing it yeah i i really was <laughs> All right. So one of the other things you said a few times in the audio version, which I didn't get, so I'm not familiar, crickets. So that what that means, it, typically in most sales organizations, that's a, a term that's used very frequently. So what happens when you're in sales is you'll have an outreach where you're trying to get a hold of a CEO. You want to get a meeting with them. They're a potential client and you reach out and you reach out and you reach out and you leave messages and and no one ever calls you back. And And so what people say is, now, all I'm getting back is crickets. It means nothing. No return phone calls, no follow-up. Uh, so it's, it's really a reflection of that sound when you're you know, sort of a tropical environment where you hear the crickets outside and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, now I know that. I'm I'm wiser for it. So your book, Heather, you have a, uh, a, a it's packed with great uh, ideas, tips. As I as I wrote in, in a post after I finished listening, I felt thoroughly out of breath, kind of nervous actually at some level because I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things that I need to be doing. So I wanted to pick off a few of the things that really stuck out for me. And in our environment today, where there's such a division in our society, there's also a lot of problematic outlook from an economic standpoint. You know, let's say fear is a big topic. But you say fear is a liar. I'd love for you to just riff off how and why fear is a liar. I, well, you know, to your point of whether it be that we have a divided society right now or that people are projecting recession and, and trying to project fear on, you know, via the media to to people. What I've learned having gone through, you know, the prior recession is when you get really scared and start operating from a place of scarcity, that's exactly what you'll see and where where you're gonna stay. It's not gonna be an enjoyable experience. Conversely, if you choose to say, I'm not signing up for this fear, I'm not signing up for this recession, I'm gonna instead flip it and see it as an opportunity. When you start leaning in and leveraging the fear that everybody else has and start using that as a catalyst to thrust you forward, you start accelerating rapidly over everybody else. 
so often you see, whether it be in a sales organization or otherwise, the people that lean into the recession and lean into these moments to say, everybody else is going home, everybody else is backing up, I'm going to double down on it. Those are the people that show up and really start winning and, and start gaining business and increasing market share and closing more business, right? So it, it really stems from that place of choosing not to see it as a fearful time, but choosing to see it as an opportunity. So I I have to picture you, or at least uh, imagine generalizations being what they are, as an optimist. Would you agree with that? I would. So then the challenge at some level uh, for having many people in my environment who might be more the glass is half empty or more interested in having contingency plans and in a different way how do you make someone more optimistic what is the what is the mojo that gets someone to get out of the fear mode and a more pessimistic mode into an optimistic mode well, a couple of different things. One, there's a chapter in my book where I share an exercise on how to shift from negativity to neutral mindset. So that's for people who are a bit more pessimistic, you know, quote unquote, in nature, that's a much easier transition for them to make. So I definitely would encourage anyone who is more of a pessimist, check that chapter out, check that worksheet out. It's really, really helpful and start practicing it. And, and you'll find it's much easier to shift into neutral. And, and I suggest that for people. Um, but there's also many other things, right? That if you're one of the things that, that I talk about so much in the book is about firing your villains, right? And so mm -hmm. for, for me, being around negative people that are whether openly or passive aggressively trying to hold you back or put you down, that's going to wear you down and inevitably, you know, eat away at any optimism you have. It just oftentimes happens without people realizing it. So that's the number one thing is to do an assessment of all the people in your life who you spend time with, rate and rank those people and see who are those people that you need to fire from your life. And we all have them, right? Most of the time, we're just trying to ignore them or keep them at bay. But when you remove negativity from your life, you create the opportunity for positive people to start showing up. So that's, for me, that was without a doubt, the most important thing in regards to shifting to optimism was getting rid of those sneaky negative people in my life. The other thing is, you know, around consuming too much media. The media is so negative these days and um, and really fear mongering, whether it be around politics or around the economy or, or world news. You know, I limit myself to very, very little media these days just because I, I don't want to sign up there. Yes, I want to know what the headlines are and, and you know, what's happening in the world but I don't consume myself with it the way that I used to when I was younger. And that's made a huge difference as well. Same with social media, right? If you're, depending on who you follow on social media, you know, sitting around scrolling on a phone all day long is not beneficial for your mindset. So limiting the time that you're spending on social media and really curating who you're following, what content you're accessing, that's all going to have a, a big um, shift in whether you're more negative or more positive. In your book, you're very forthright about explaining your background and, and the challenges you had, and and certainly, obviously, the firing that you experienced. And, and I was wondering, for starters, was there any catharsis or did you feel any benefit to writing about that with this woman firing you? And, and or was that through the gratitude that you showed at the end for the fact that she did fire you? You know, I guess what's happened since I've written this book, which, um, you know, I was proud of myself. I, I also believe shining a light on shame is the only way to extinguish shame in your life. And that's another holdback for a lot of people. It was a holdback for me. There was initially a sense of shame getting fired, you know, like, oh, that's bad. And you're not supposed to get fired. And how would I get fired? You know, how is this even happening? So for me, shining a light on it and sharing it, not only did it empower others to feel, oh, I don't have to feel shameful that I was fired. Oh, thank you for you know extending this opportunity. So it actually empowered me to feel better about um, facing a difficult situation and sharing it with people. So that was a really positive experience. And then you know, fast forward to, I came to a place in my life after having written this book around focusing on forgiveness for people in my life. And I remember I deliberately wrote down, you know, on a list of people that I wanted to forgive my life. And one was the woman that fired me. You know, I don't have any any hard feelings about 
you know, that she fired me. I don't have any ill will. I hate seeing the company stock perform so poorly after I worked so hard for 14 years, you know, to elevate that stock and build a team. So it's almost, you know, it, it breaks my heart, but um, I don't have ill will towards her. And yeah, if anything, I feel grateful. I would not have made the jump into doing what I, I was born to do and meant to do had that woman not pushed me out. So yeah, I do have gratitude for, for her firing me. I, I'm thinking back to the villains in my own life and and how they they're not in my life, but certainly I feel I can think about them and I, I need to maybe exercise them, exorcise them myself. So in your background, Heather, you're very forthright about explaining how you were brought up and and um, let's say the the challenging environment you had, um, obviously, you know, not much money, uh, being brought up by your grandparents. And it feels for me that that definitely contributed to a certain type of energy and hunger in you. Now you're a mom. You have your son with about whom you talk. How do you transmit that passion, energy, hunger? How does how does it go? And I think about this as a father of two children and other people. Yeah, I mean, I had a an awful upbringing. I had an awful childhood that I wouldn't wish on anyone. However, there are benefits to you know growing up poor and struggling, and you know. It taught me a work ethic from the time I think I was nine or 10 when I started my first paper route. I've been working every day ever since. So I have an incredible work ethic, which really allowed me to elevate quickly in business. You know, and that's a gift and a blessing. I didn't know it at the time. I hated it at the time. You know, I saw my other friends going on vacations and, and living a different life, but it gave me this gift that I didn't realize I was receiving, which was an incredible work ethic and this passion and drive, you know, to get ahead. My son grew up very differently than I than I have. My son has a different personality that I that I have because he's gone through very different experiences. And so, while he is definitely a much more laid back soul, he's you know he's definitely chill. He doesn't feel like this. I have this constant desire and need to want to get ahead and to accomplish you know big things. He isn't necessarily driven that same way. However, when he's on the basketball court, he is. He will run through walls, smash his teeth out. Like I see, I see a side of me in him that is, it comes out at, at times when his passion is ignited. So that it, versus me, it's sort of all the time. I, I say to people all the time, I just run hot. Like I'm always on, I'm always going. He's not like that, you know, but when he finds something he really wants or he's really passionate about, you know, that's ignited in him. And so as a parent, for me, it's just about appreciating the differences and and you know I'm happy for him he doesn't have to be constantly going I'm I'm happy he's more relaxed than than I was and and I learn from it if anything he's teaching me how to relax more as a person and not drive so so much so I think it's more about just appreciating you know our differences certainly and in in terms of the mojo that is within Heather Monahan that element that drive is hard to invent and uh, observations that one might have about for example immigrant families the the first generation comes in they do everything they send back money to their families at home they bring up the kids to be better than they are and their grandchildren are usually professionals uh, that you know have an easy life and and gone is that sort of drive and i think it's something that is is really important to to remember. I mean, I've been brought up uh, much more like your son, lucky, privileged. I never had to go to war. Uh, and and my grandfather was killed in the Second World War. And I wanted to explore that and think about the real challenges of life and 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 stop thinking of entitlement. Because in the end of the day, you can't, as I say, invent your drive. And and so the challenge we have somehow for people looking around us at, at more entitled people is to is to foster that challenge is good and and that drive is essential. How do we get it? 
So if you're looking to be more driven, you know, holding your uh, yourself accountable to me, I think is a great idea. You know, one of the things that when I wanted to write my second book, but I didn't really want to put the work in, I post on social media. I'm launching a new book. I can't wait for you to read it. I want to hear what you think. So I reverse engineer pressure on myself. And I suggest that to people. Hold yourself accountable. Put the pressure on yourself. Announce the moves you're going to make. And then you're going to work like your tail off because you feel accountable to deliver on it. Yeah, they, that's what they say. If you want to lose weight, then you um, should write, I'm going to plan to lose 10 pounds or or something like that. And then that makes you feel accountable to it. So one of the trickier areas that I wanted to get into is, well, first of all, let's start with an easier part. The fact is that you were brought up in media. I mean, professionally, you did a lot of work in radio and everything. And I was wondering to what extent that has helped in your career, because in writing the book and knowing how to speak and knowing how to get gigs and speaking on podcasts, it feels like it's something, it's been a really interesting bedrock, uh, which has helped in helping you to create your platform. You know, I was on, I was not on the forward facing side of the media business. I was not the talent. I was in charge of driving the revenue for um, the company. So I was on the back side of the business where now I'm on the forward facing side. So I, I don't know. I mean, I was I was constantly exposed to who talent was, what they were doing. I saw it in motion all the time, but I wasn't practicing it. You know, I was speaking um, at, you know, corporate events, national events in regards to revenue generation and leadership and building teams and sales. So that element was forward facing, but not from the day to day, you know, hosting a podcast or doing a radio show, but I, I was exposed to it. And anything you're exposed to that you're around enough, you can begin to imagine, you know, okay, I could see myself doing this, or maybe that's a possibility. So I guess in some ways, you know, it certainly opened my mind to it, but it wasn't until I got fired that I ever thought, okay, let's go all in and, and see if I can do this. So as I was mentioning before, getting into the trickier topics, if you will, you write a lot about, I would say, the female side of things. So for specifically, you, you often talk about your dress and how you dress before an event, something I obviously would think about, but certainly would never write about. You're like, well, I, I got the really boring gray suit out or, you know, the same, because <laughs> I used to wear a tie back in those days. But um, to, I, I feel like there's a, you're, you're very much able to embrace the female side of it. And to what extent did you think about that f as a style or book for women and or for men? No, I never write for a woman or for a man. I, I am a woman, so I'm writing from, you know, my life experiences, but I'm never writing it specifically for a man or for a woman. And it's funny that you say that about clothes. A friend of mine who's a male cares more about his dress on the daily than I ever do. So I really, I don't think it is a, a male or a female thing. I think it's more certain people, you know, my sister could care less what she wears, has never cared a day in her life. You know, it's just, but she's very focused on, what content she's consuming, what books she's reading. That's a huge focus for her in her life. People are just different, like what may, you know, what they might want to focus on or, or what is relevant and important to them. And none of it really matters. It's just indicators to what can potentially give you confidence in a different moment. For me, wearing certain colors of clothes or, or certain outfits really elevates my level of confidence, which makes it much easier for me to take massive stages and, and to go beyond what I've done before in my life. So those are some of the tips I like to leverage for people, but it doesn't mean that you need to wear a blue dress because I wore a blue dress. What it's, I'm trying to shine a light on is that we all have our own triggers or our own levers that we can pull in moments of self-doubt so that we can leapfrog over those moments of self-doubt and get on the other side where our true confidence is waiting for us. You've got questions, we've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network, 
and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, well, so to push back a little bit, Heather, you, you talk about your weight, for example, and 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 I I felt like, well, maybe it's just a, a language I'm not used to hearing. I mean, obviously, I I, have, I mean, I've been around the block, so I understand, but it's not like something that I would talk about. And I feel that one of the wonderful things of your book is that vulnerability that you show. You you share things that are deeply imperfect in you. And, and that is not how I was brought up. I was brought up with stiff upper lip and this idea of the image story. And I kind of feel somehow, this is where it's tricky, that this is a more feminine art. Yeah, no, I don't I don't agree with that. No, vulnerability, I don't think is feminine or masculine. I think it's a choice and it's a courageous choice, right? It's really about courage because I grew up the same way. Don't ever tell people if you're afraid, don't tell people your personal life, hide that you have weaknesses, never let anyone know because they're going to exploit them and try to take advantage of you. So I grew up that way and I leveraged in business that stiff upper lip for a long time. And then I remember having a child and thinking, well, I don't know what the heck I'm doing now. Yeah, I know what I'm doing in business, but I don't know what I'm doing at home. And suddenly, as I began to accept that, I just started opening up my mind to what if I ever brought this to the workplace and shared that I actually don't have all the answers on how to run the company every single day. I wonder. And so I would, in small conversations and small pieces, started to bring that vulnerability into work. And we used to call it lightning in a bottle. I mean, the response I would get from my team was overwhelming how, from a leadership perspective, how much the connection, the deepening of that connection with the team and and the trust factor and the culture and how things started changing. And once I started opening myself up to it, my team started opening themselves, their selves up to it. And then trust was flowing everywhere and then productivity and innovation. And, and I just saw the results and the ROI and vulnerability and it was brilliant. And so to me, I don't think it's a feminine or masculine Initiative, I think it's a it's one around courage. Yeah, as uh, Brene Brown would say, it's uh, very much about having the courage to show your weakness. And and uh, I, I've obviously had a I've had my own executive experience, and and I remember very much the first time I ever cried in public, and and how that was a really a, um, a sh- shift in my perception of the idea of image versus vulnerability image projection and, and and how vulnerability at that level to the extent that it's genuine because you don't want to just sort of say stuff but it it doesn't bring you down in in their eyes it actually brings you closer in connection with you because they feel oh well, my gosh this is actually a human being who's imperfect like me Agreed. So um, you talk a fair amount about beliefs and and try to understand them. And you talked about this retrospective truth and the time and turning the time machine on its head. I, I found this one particularly interesting because I think a lot of people are stuck on beliefs, making beliefs their flag, the thing that's the most important. And and somehow going down rabbit holes and wormholes that aren't healthy. So could you explain to us a little bit more about how we should look at and manage our beliefs? Yeah, the book is built on a three-part um, framework, which is called the back system, beliefs, action, and knowledge. The first section of the book is around beliefs. And so the first step when leveraging the back framework is to take whatever belief that you're holding and ultimately boil it down to the most simplistic shred of fact that you can find. If there is any, oftentimes you'll find there is no factual basis for it, which is great news because you can throw that belief out. But we'll use the example of when I got fired. Um, In that moment, when I was fired, I held the belief that I've lost everything. So I had to challenge myself by using my own framework to say, okay, have I actually lost everything? And this is the process I went through. No, I didn't lose my health. I didn't lose my business skills, my network, my experiences, my business acumen. I didn't lose, I didn't lose really my friends, my family. I didn't really lose anything. I lost a paycheck. And that was fact. 
there was fact in that. So when I boiled down from I've lost everything, so I've lost a paycheck, suddenly it became much easier to move through that belief to step two, which was action and start doing something about it. So, so something I strongly suggested people, whatever belief you're holding, boil it down to the most simplistic shred of fact that you can find. And what nine out of 10 times you'll find is there is no fact to it. And then somehow the thing that I try to do, Heather, with my clients and such is to, if you have a belief, it, at least it must be also linked into your values. How do you react to that? It could be, it, it, it may not, right? So um, my belief that I thought I lost everything, I don't think that was about values. I think it was about reacting to a, a difficult situation. It was just a natural fear or a reaction. I don't think that was so much about values. I guess it depends on the situation. You know, every isolated incident may be a little bit different. And the more emotional you are, the more you're probably going to tend to react and potentially see things through a negative lens or, or a fearful lens, you know, when something um, like getting fired happens. So it, I guess it really depends on the situation. Yeah. And it, it, it also depends on to what extent you really know yourself, I feel. And, and for example, to what extent you really know your own values. And so you, I, I'm, you're in your mid forties, as you say, proudly in the book, how do you feel on the journey of knowing yourself that Heather Monahan is today? Yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time, you know, doing um, personal work, whether it be through therapy or journaling or writing and, you know, being incredibly vulnerable. So I think these days I, I know myself pretty well. You know, it, it's definitely a work in progress. It's not something you can give up on, in my opinion. It's something you need to keep working on. We're always all changing all the time, you know, entering different phases of our lives and doing different things. And so um, it's an ongoing process, but I, I think I'm, I think I'm doing pretty well with it. Yeah. I had a, a lovely a psychologist on my show a few months ago and Michelle Nevaras, and she said, uh, it takes more than a lifetime to get to know yourself. And which leads me to the next thought, which is you, you say it several times and, and I think it's very powerful. You say, ask, only advice or only ask advice from people who know who've gone where you want to go. So there are two challenges to that. One is actually pinning down where you want to go. And two, finding people who, you, who have really gone through it. Give us some tips on how to figure that little path. I don't know how people can't pin down what they want to do, right? I mean, if, if you don't know, you've got to start down a path and, and taking yourself there to see if it feels right to you. You know, maybe that would help you accelerate it or, or say, hey, this doesn't feel right. I, I don't like this. But to me, I, I always have clarity in what I want to do. It doesn't mean every single thing works out, but I feel really clear. Oh, I, you know, I want to launch a, a, a clothing line. And so I targeted Perry Ellis and we partnered together and the clothing line ended up failing, which you know, was unfortunate. However, I was clear I wanted to do it. Like that was something, oh, maybe that'll happen in the future. Then the timing wasn't right. Maybe not the right partner. I'm not sure. But I mean, just open yourself up to, you know, whatever your intuition is telling you and, and go for it and you'll figure it out along the way. I think that's the most important advice I would give somebody. And then, you know, next to that is finding, identifying who those people are, whether in your current sphere of influence or social networks, who have been and done the things that you wanted to do. Like I identified the CEO of Perry Ellis. He was in my community. I knew I could find him and get to him, right? So I just did the research and then I was relentless in my pursuit to find him. So, you know, it's about not, not taking no for an answer, not, you know, just there's always another way. You just need to challenge yourself not to give up. Most people will give up after, you know, one or two no's or roadblocks and walk away don't be average, you know, challenge yourself to break through that barrier to get to that next level. And then if you can, or you can't find that person, you, there are countless TED Talks, countless social media profiles where people just create content around teaching you how to do different things, right? There are countless people out there in the world who have done what it is that you want to do, just access their content and start learning from there. The area it goes into is, is ambition somehow. And of course you have the drive but you set yourself a target somehow, an ambition. And, and I think that a lot of people today, 
suffer for not knowing what ambition to have. It's this sort of vague idea. And if you don't have that gnawing need to accomplish something, it, it can very easily just turn into being a sloth and and this entitlement idea that I had before. So do you do you feel that in your circle, of course you have a particular circle, but do you do you see ambition as a something that's transmissible, something that you can inspire in other people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you surround yourself with people who are constantly challenging themselves to get to the next level, sharing their goals, going after them, failing publicly, pushing themselves back up, if those are the type of people you're spending your time with, you will inevitably join them in some way, shape, or form. Just as easily if, if you surround yourself with people who are constantly talking about the past, reveling in the past, not working on new projects, and sitting on your, their couch, you're going to inevitably end up sitting with them on the couch. So yeah, it goes back to overcoming your villains, getting rid of the people holding you back so that you can spring forward. Yeah, so surround yourself with people uh, that you'd like to be minded with, like-minded with, and, and make that your target. One of the funny things you talk about is that you got rejected 14 times. And so that's a perfect uh, demonstration of, of going beyond the no and, and, and finding that sort of resilience. At the same time, I was thinking, at, at what point during that journey of the 14 no's, did you think your agent could have been a villain? I mean, at the end of the day, no, no, you're not good enough. No, this isn't good enough for Heather. No, it's not good. You could take that to be villainous type of rejection. How do you decipher between villain and just a plain old no? It's so clear. One has a malicious intent and a harmful intent and one does not. And so it's very, very clear. You just need to listen to yourself, trust your intuition. My agent never had a, any type of villain intent in her. She's not that type of person. It was always, you know what? This is good and this improvement's good, but there's still something missing, Heather. I know there's more within you. Like it was always a positive. She might not have been giving me accolades, but it was never versus that woman that I worked with that, you know, ended up firing me. There was always this, I'm going to stab you in the back. I'm not going to respond to your email. I'll smile publicly, but when I see you privately, I am going to be so rude to you. There was always this back and forth that none of it made sense. It felt very uncomfortable. It, I knew something was wrong. So trust your gut and listen to your intuition. You'll know who the, the people are that are villains and who the ones are who are just telling you no for that, for that moment in time. So something else that you wrote about that I appreciated, and, and it reminds me of a story I would, um, I worked at Redken, the hairdressing company. I ran it for a few years. And one of our, my chief uh, artists and a mentor was a guy called Chris Barron. And, and uh, he was a titan. He is a titan in the hairdressing industry. And he's a Canadian. And he said to me one day, I can go as soon as I have committed to going to a small event or an event. If only three people show up, I want to make those three people stars. Feel like they made the best decision of their lives and, and not get into the mode of, oh my God, why aren't I talking in front of 100,000 people? And I felt that that was very much your type of mojo turning a bad situation into a good situation and giving your full energy. Is that something that you can still subscribe to, even though you've got to the status you have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in my opinion, we're all here to make this world a better place, right? And if, and if we're not doing all that we can do to make that happen in any situation, we're never going to find the joy that's potentially out there for us. So yeah, I challenge myself to do that regardless of the size of an audience. You know, it's it's not about speaking to thousands of people. It's about having the potential to speak life into someone or to help someone change their life for the better. And, you know, that's what it's really all about. You say at one point, you talked about fear earlier, there's a thin line between fear and excitement. Uh, I uh, was thinking as I listened to that, there's also a thin line between good and bad stress. So I was wondering what, to what extent you believe that as well, between fear and excitement, good and bad stress. 
I mean, I'm not a fan of stress. I, I do all that I can to meditate, work out, and get away from stress personally because I put enough pressure on myself. I don't really need any additional pressure. But I guess for some people, you know, there is good stress that they they want to push themselves a bit more. But I definitely am a fan of finding ways to remove stress from my life. I'm always looking for an easy button. I always want to find a way to make it easier, to make things go more smoothly, and to find ways to move away from stress, especially after the pandemic and just seeing the impact it's had on so many people in a negative way. It's really opened my eyes to, I just, I don't have a place for stress in my life. And yet there's a sort of tenterhooks between fear and excitement because the emotional drive that if you're, whoa, I'm going to fail here, that actually can be a good stress because I sure shit don't plan to fail. I am going to. So the fear driver, the fear of failure sort of kicks me into gear. So it's a, there can be good stress all the same. I'm, I'm sure for a lot of people, that is absolutely the case. When, when I talk about the fine line between fear and excitement, that's a tactic that I use when I take really large stages. If I start getting nervous, I just start saying out loud, I'm excited, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. And I can speak that very quickly and pivot from feeling nervous to feeling very excited. And anyone could do that. Yes, yeah, you, you're definitely someone who likes to manifest what you're planning to do and talk you through it and bring you through the words I say it, I am it, and it, it it drives you through. Something else I I particularly appreciated was um, this idea of reframing apologies. So things that could have been, you know, or you feel regretful or, or apologetic about, and reframing it as gratefulness. Tell us a little bit more about that because I'm all about gratefulness. Yeah, too often, uh, you know, culture has everybody apologizing for everything, things they didn't even do, you know, and not that, I mean, I believe if you trip somebody and they get hurt, obviously, you're going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to do that. That was a mistake or, or whatnot. But for, you know, little things, you know, you walk into a meeting a couple minutes late, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, all we're doing is putting ourselves beneath other people and making everything about ourselves. When instead you can turn it around and make it about the other people. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for waiting for me. Thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you for understanding. Make it about that other person and turn it into a moment of gratitude where you get to, you know, show how grateful you are for these other people. And it turns out to be such a positive reframe for everybody. It's like your attitude of abundance versus scarcity. And I feel like in business today, you who have had plenty of experience within business, this notion of fear, the notion of scarcity in marketing, by the way, still remains a, a potent mm -hmm. method. There's, there's still a lot of scarcity mongering and fear mongering going around, it, whether it's in the media, but also in the way management is. And, and what is it that's going to help a manager, leader, click in and get this idea of moving away from fear and control and their ego issues into more of an attitude of abundance. Typically that starts from the top in an organization. So I would suggest looking around the company that you're working for and seeing what cues, you know, leadership is displaying culture, you know, is set from the top and that tone. If you are in a culture of scarcity, micromanagement and control, there's very little someone's going to be able to do to change and evolve in that environment. And you need to remove yourself from that environment and find a team, find a place where people are abundant and encouraging and trusting and, you know, a much healthier culture. So the last area I wanted to talk about was uh, you, you mentioned it several times and obviously going through the pandemic, we had all the zooms and all that, but you talk about the power of face-to-face -face meetings and I was wondering, it, it almost like some sort of extra behind the scenes, to what extent face-to-face uh, -face really is it? I mean, you, you mentioned how it, if I get in their face, or at least I, no, that's not how you say it, but if I'm in their presence, it's much harder to say no. Is, is, that, is that something that really needs to transcend our Zoom world? We need to get out. And, and see everybody and hug everybody or at least you know be be present with people and to what extent is is the physicality also something that you believe in like shaking hands and all that part 
without a doubt, you know, if, if someone, I just think of myself, if someone wants to ask me for something and they send me a text message, it's very easy to say no and just keep my day going. If someone sends me an email, it is so easy to not reply or to say no, I have no time, right? But if someone is standing in front of me and making a case for something they're asking me for, it's very hard to say no to someone, right? You want to help people. So 100%, and this is business advice I've been giving my entire life, if something is truly important to you and you want a yes, my agent said no to me 14 times over a computer. She and I were not in the same state, right? I am certain I would have gotten a yes long before I did, before 15, had she and I been meeting, like in the old days, like we would have been if there had not been a global pandemic. So, you know, I just, I have far too much experience with this. If something is very important to you, make it important for the other person and go face to face with them. In regards to physicality, I can tell you having been back in in person events now, it's incredible the the feedback that we see now the response from the audiences it's like nothing i've ever had the privilege of of seeing before and i've been speaking for over 20 years it's not that i'm that much better it's not that the other speakers are that much better it's that there's this hunger and this absence that people you know are longing for to fill that physical void or just the energy around being around others and how much appreciation there is for it today. So I definitely see it in real time. It's very exciting to see. That's funny. My wife and I were commenting. We have always enjoyed giving dinner parties where we invite six to eight people over and we do theme dinner parties. And it has been our observation that since the end, or at least where we're allowed to come back and have dinner parties, the, the the level of energy is absolutely electric. There's almost like some kind of nervousness perhaps within it, but then there's just this hunger that you were talking about to to laugh, to to share, and and uh, maybe this is the, the parting word, the this desire for a, a more positive humanity is going to shine through. And we have to get rid of the fear. And uh, to use your words, we have to reach to reach our full potential. We need to take risks. And that's part of life is knowing how to manage the challenges, the shit, the difficulties, and, and not just overcoming your villains, but overcoming the challenges is what it, it amounts to, including the risks that we might have a, have a, you know, a problem, but that's worth it if it's about humanity. Agreed. Heather, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your thoughts. What's the best way for people to to follow you, get your book, see what you're up to? My website is heathermonahan.com. I'm on all social media at Heather Monahan. My first book is Confidence Creator. Second one's Overcome Your Villains. You can find those anywhere you purchase books. And you can get my podcast, Creating Confidence with Heather Monahan, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Fabulous. Well, I'll put all those show notes into the show. Thank you so much, Heather. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 or more blog posts on mintodile.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Uh, 
convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man, challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man, competition's innate. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. Revenges and struggle with deceit Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger Tucked around me Precipitating the danger To feel free Trust in my reason And let me show you why I'm a convinced man, practicing my lines. I'm a convinced man, here in these confines. A convinced man, in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man, fit to the test. I'm a convinced man. questions, we've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business, when you need it, from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.